This is it, your angel's foot entering your cinematic universe in three, two, one. Take it away. Thanks, Angel Spit. Welcome to your cinematic universe. What is your cinematic universe? Well, you're already creating it right now, whether it's a post on social media, fan art, fan fiction, all that's left to do is mold it all together into one big cinematic universe, your cinematic universe. Here at New York Comic Con, we're gonna figure out how to elevate storytelling with the audience. I've got five incredible panelists here to help us figure this out. We have Ahmed Best, host of Star Wars Jedi Temple Challenge, and he also plays three characters in the Star Wars universe. We have Jeff Gomez, the leading mind in transmedia storytelling an advisor to Disney for Star Wars and Marvel, Danny Fingeroff, the author of Stan Lee's biography, best known for his long stint as editor of the Spider-Man comic, Aaron Vanek, founder of LARP Senses and a game design educator, and finally, Jan Lucanis, the founder of Real World, which is a startup building cinematic universes with fandom, and he's also the creator of Justice for Hire. And let's of course remember Autumn Noel Kelly, our moderator, former Newsweek journalist and audience development editor at io9 and Gizmodo. There's a separation between fans and brands, storytellers, and those who consume the stories, especially within the studio structure. When, how, and why did the current culture get set in the way of thinking that audience and story are two separate entities? I'd love to hear from you, Jeff, uh, because of your transmedia storytelling background. Narrative, story, uh, began um, uh, in, in the prehistory of, of humanity as a collective experience. Uh, a story was shared um, by indigenous people around the campfire or in the cave. That uh, was a kind of conversation. Uh, uh, the, the, the one in the tribe, so to speak, who was uh, more imaginative perhaps, more sensitive to the world, might have started sharing a, a little bit more. But if that person um, uh, uh, didn't adjust the narrative to be inclusive, to, to, uh, to, to acknowledge the participation of others, that person did not remain the storyteller for long. <laughs> um, uh, and so um, uh, there was a, a kind of communal narrative in, uh, in early humanity. Um, uh, that started to change once we became uh, capable of projecting story beyond our immediate uh, community. And, uh, and it became supercharged in the Industrial Revolution when uh, we were capable of generating newspapers and novels and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, dividing ourselves from those who were telling the story to those many more who were receiving the story. Uh, then the, the story became the purview of, well, the, the elite, the, those who could afford to communicate to the masses uh, helped to shape the reality that the masses perceived. And, um, and that only uh, became uh, stronger and stronger. Uh, my personal experience of, um, of where things really uh, uh, started to change was that I was in charge of the uh, uh, editorial letters at uh, a comic book company called Valiant. And I started to notice that the fans uh, didn't particularly like the editorial direction of, of the comics uh, at the time. And, um, uh, and, and that kind of preceded uh, problems with, with sales. Um, and, and then I started to see a, a fan discussion about comic books on these bulletin boards on the internet and started to notice how uh, because of anonymity, it became darker, uh, more extreme and, uh, and problematic. And, uh, and this was in the early 1990s. So um, uh, uh, you, you then uh, uh, started to see the, the toxicity that started to creep into um, uh, this participative uh, culture. The cultural interaction between narrative storytelling and audience participation um, has, is historically greater than it hasn't been. Um, Star Wars, when I did Star Wars and when I played Jar Jar in Star Wars, um, that was probably the first global, um, I, that was a, attention to toxicity and fandom via social media. Yeah. And there wasn't any, um, the platforms that we use right now didn't exist. It was like chat rooms and websites and people really had to like care to hate something back then. <laughs> and because Star Wars was such a global phenomenon, it really brought attention to what is now called toxic fandom. So, um, but even with the toxicity in the fandom, 
the attention to the uh, almost the, the entitlement of audience participation in narrative storytelling was um, not only outlined, but in the spotlight. In terms of live action role playing, I think it's a really in different approach than uh, in terms of an art form and a medium of expression, because what we're talking about here is movies, comic books, literature, and things like that. And how are those things created as art forms? You have an artist or collection of artists who create it, and then they push this out to the world. And, and they hope that it falls upon an audience that enjoys that work. And LARPing, uh, although it precedes role-playing games, heavily is heavily influenced on role-playing games such as Dungeons and Dragons. And in that situation, you have people who are making it with you. The actual, actual act of creation is made with the participants instead of a separate artist pushing out to someone else. And the best definition of live action role playing I, I heard was that LARPing is a medium of expression that allows people, empowers people to tell stories about themselves. And that is critical and very crucial for something. And so that when a designer of a live action role playing event is creating something, it's not, well, here's my vision of the world and you guys are gonna act it out and hopefully you'll meet with it. It's here's a world, here's what things are going on in the world, let's play. What are you gonna do in this world with these other people, with these elements that come in? And it's far more, I, I think, actively calling upon all the participants to create the world itself and the fiction that, and the narrative that happens. I strongly empathize with what you're talking about because those ancient traditions of, of yearning to be a part of the proscenium, a part of the gods, a, a participant in some kind of cosmic relationship it, is being replayed to this very day and, and allows us to tap into the deepest aspects of our creativity and maybe make a buck. Yeah. So Danny, this one's actually for you. Um, <laughs> yes, you. Uh, you kind of represent, in my eyes, the comic book world in this panel. And the comic book world is the foundation of the kind of current global pop culture phenomenon that we call the superhero film. Um, and if we were to kind of involve audience more in building a cinematic universe, the audience would need to be held within a structure that moves the, the story forward. And, and comic books have been successfully doing this with thousands of characters in a shared collective universe for a, for a very long time. Can you walk us through how the comic book industry has been able to manage such a massive amount of characters in one story world? Yeah, and can you do that in like two minutes? Yes. <laughs> well, I could probably do it down. in three. Two might be, uh, <laughs> you know, look, comics have been part of people's everyday life since the comic strips where things like Gasoline Alley and Dick Tracy managed dozens, hundreds of characters. And there's always been audience participation in, in slow motion. In other words, uh, you know, postcards, letters. Um, and so uh, comic books have a similar thing. I mean, obviously the Marvel Universe is the most successful and, and, po and popular at, 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 at transposing that from the comics to the movies. And it took a long, long time to do that. It took several generations of Hollywood executives having to like retire and die so that people could <laughs> come in and say, oh, look what, what they've been doing that's been, you know, uh, addicting children and teenagers for 50 years. Maybe we could do that too. And the participation is letters, letters and letters columns. The, the ultimate expression of that, I think, is when Spider-Man first got the black costume. Right. The idea of a black costume for Spider-Man was sent in by a fan. And, um, and Jim Shooter, I think, uh, you know, they tried to work with the guy to let him write the story, but he wasn't quite up to whatever a professional level then. But Marvel did pay him uh, money for the idea of Spider-Man in a black costume. And I guess the next step, which is uh, what gaming does and, and, and what uh, Jan is trying to do is to sort of make that participation more immediate and more pervasive. And, and uh, Stan Lee used to like to say that the, you know, that you are our real editors, you know, well, part of that was hype and part of that was true as, as storytellers, our question and, and the, you know, the trillion dollar question is, are our readers and viewers, our editors and our bosses? 
you know, what Danny was saying about Spider-Man and stuff, that if a creator is creating something that's very unique and special in their boundary, that they actually take that into the canon. They accept that, that you can kind of accept that a fan might be very creative and ingenious and able to add value to the property by their creation. And, and I think it's great that Marvel, you know, paid an artist who's like, let's do Spider-Man in a black costume and things like that. I think being open to it. And so it's, I think it's a mindset ultimately of Hollywood and not seeing it as a situation of, we have these paid creators and they are creating something and we're going to push it to you and we want you to like it. And you're actually inviting to a certain degree, the audience themselves to be co-creators and and th that does give up some control but realize you can create the boundaries that they're controlling things in yeah uh, would you I, like to add yeah i gotta add to this because I, I i'm totally i totally agree uh, i mean this is stuff that that i've been personally working on for for many many years this is stuff that jeff gomez has predicted you know uh, 20 something years ago i mean it, it is inevitable that we will get there as a culture everyone's walking around with these production studios in their pockets i mean um i, I look at it from the standpoint of direction that uh, the the director has the most nuanced understanding of it. any sector of entertainment I've I've worked in. Um, the director is the one that really understands how to work with people toward a goal. And for us to to look at uh, these boundaries, Aaron, that you're saying uh, as a as, as DC, uh, I think was calling it a while back uh, as a sandbox because every director, you know, when they were doing Suicide Squad, the first one, and, and like every director had their own little place inside the sandbox. Um, that if we are putting people, the audience on creative, uh, essentially creative rails uh, via the rule set, um, the content that they create, because now we're talking, I'm talking about making movies with the world, talking about making shows with the world, talking about making commercials, et cetera. Uh, if there are a, a set rules and then there's directorial guidance, um, we're going to get great content because people are already making great co content. So if you can essentially establish rules that if they follow their content is canonical, because one of the, the biggest challenges and you'll see platforms like, um, like, like Tongle, for example, um, you know, the, that's a, that's an ad agency platform, but you'll see stuff where people are creating content. Doritos has something too, like Legion of the Bold. Uh, people create content and then they submit it and it may or may not be used. And that sucks. That sucks if you go through the process of creating something, you send it in, and then it just disappears into the void. And I think that there's a way for us to, to take the social media mindset of that positive, consistent positive feedback loop when someone is, is posting something or getting a like, et cetera, and actually apply that to storytelling and apply that to us sharing creativity together toward a goal of building out your world. Like, well, like it's going to happen. And I think that, uh, you know, the... The, you, you mentioned the, that the, essentially the thinking needs to change in Hollywood. And um, you know, I, I don't expect that necessarily to come as much from the Hollywood sector as it's gonna come from um, you know, scrappy startups like ours or people who are just immersed in the, in the world of, of, uh, of making stuff together and sharing. I'm just gonna take a slightly different kind of gaze on this thing. And I think we should look at Hollywood like we look at chunky spaghetti sauce. <laughs> If you don't like it, don't eat it. And I think Hollywood is this thing where we believe that we all have to achieve, right? And it's not necessarily a place where you can achieve your ultimate creativity, especially when you're talking about the studio system. Because at the end of the day, they have stockholders that they have to appeal to, and they have to make X amount of dollars per year. So they are going to take and make the things that can get more eyeballs on screen and more butts and seats so they can um, satisfy their stockholders, right? And that might not necessarily be the thing that we all want to see. It's just the thing that they can make palatable to a larger audience. It is a very risk averse business, Hollywood. Now, the fact where we are right now, we have all of these accessible distribution models, not just on the social media platform, but, and the thing that I'm really excited about is the augmented reality platform, where you can take an idea um, in which you've created a, a large situation and put that in the actual world. So what these new distribution models do, I think, 
is make this idea of mapping accessible through your smartphone, right? And rather than build an elaborate environment, the environment is, or, or your reality is extended, creating a virtual environment with the environment that you live in. So I don't think Hollywood should be the goal. I think it should be a choice. And you can choose to go that route and there's nothing wrong with it. But I think there needs to be chunky spaghetti sauce, basil and garlic, ara arabiata. You have to have all of these different um, choices to make and they're all good. Ahmed, you've had a hand in creating some of the characters you portrayed within the machine that is the Star Wars universe. Can you talk about that experience and how are you taking those learnings and applying them as a teacher at USC and to the audience with your world building initiative at Newhouse? My experience in Star Wars kind of set me on this entire path. And, you know, I was very, I, I, I entered every day at work with open eyes and open ears. And I th I think what happened with me is I really watched I really watched George Lucas work and I watched how he built the worlds that he built and tied everything together and it's very different from what Disney's doing now it's, it's it's extremely different because at the end of the day you only had to answer to one guy and you see how fast iteration is when it's just you know, one guy's idea, one guy's vision, as opposed to a committee of people who think they know, right? Less decisions get made and everybody's worried about getting fired. Like in, in, in Star Wars, I was the only one worried about getting fired, you know? <laughs> I was right off the Broadway stage going, I don't know what's happening. But starting my career off in this very huge major movie really made me see the possibilities. And it really gave me confidence in this idea that you can have an idea and see it through and trust your content, which is what I always say to not only my students, but to my, you know, my peer group as well, who are all creators. So um, because I came up in that environment, I don't have a fear of trying anything new. And I don't have a fear of this idea that it might not work. You know what I'm saying? Um, as a performing artist and as somebody who started in theater, it might not work as a part of the job every night. And sometimes you go out on stage and you do something and it doesn't work. And we talk about, you know, the audience participation and the wonderful thing about audience participation is if it doesn't work, they let you know, like immediately, you know, you don't get the laugh or you don't get the tear or, or you just get nothing. And then, you know, the beautiful thing is the next day you can go, okay, let's try something else. So being brought up in that and, and being reared in that type of environment um, really put my purview as far as doing what I'm doing now, just on, on, a, on a different level, because I'm not really concerned with falling on my face. I'm, I'm really cool with that. You know, I really enjoy it and I, and I learn from it. So when um, Star Wars came back to me and asked me to, to do another show, Jedi Temple Challenge, uh, I... Um, at first, decided I didn't want to do it because Star Wars is this thing that kind of takes over your life. And you can see it um, now with the sequel guys, you know, Oscar Isaacs and John Boyega. They're just like, I'm never doing this again. And I'm always, I always say to them, yeah, wait 20 years. <laughs> You'll probably be back. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because that's what I did. I waited 20 years. But, you know, right after the prequels, I was just like, this is just too much. And as an artist, I want to do other things. I want to be able to expand, you know. Um, but the beautiful thing is you are witnessing world building and LARPing and comic book lore and mythology and um, Shakespeare and the Greek chorus all in this one thing. And it's emotionally um, stimulating and you get, you get, you fall in love with it. And now you're, everyone tries to find, everybody who's been in a Star Wars movie tries to find that again, like that feeling of, being involved in this universe that's being created um, from this collective and collaborative imagination. So when I started moving into doing my world building work and with my podcast, the Afrofuturist podcast and um, uh, being in love with Afrofuturism as a kid, you know, growing up listening to Sun Ra and watching Star Trek and um, being in love with comic books, it really influenced 
um, how I wanted to approach all of these things. And then, you know, being interested in new and emerging technologies and weighted ways to distribute, there's an avenue there now to get ideas out um, in ways other than those that are traditional, right? And then there's also this idea of augmenting those traditional ways. I think the whole cosplay phenomenon is, is important in this, that it's, that it's people not just dressing up for a contest or, or for a masquerade, but showing up at an event, walking around at an event as a character, as different characters, and you see them, right? Somebody, I'm, at, I'm at a table at a convention, um, and somebody dressed as Wonder Woman, often a guy dressed as Wonder Woman comes up, or somebody dressed as Spider-Man, and they, they exist on those two levels. They exist as the person, right, whoever is in the costume. But then you kind of think, well, look, Spider-Man is talking to me. I mean, this is what it might be. And there's something about sort of that type of crowd sourcing or, or crowd participation where somebody is, is just saying, I don't need any, any world. I am my world, and I'm going to yeah. walk around in the so-called real world. There's some power to that that can be tapped into for storytelling and, 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 and for, and for uh, viewer particip participation, identification, that I think is, is an element that, that, that shouldn't be neglected by any medium. That's actually a perfect lead into my question for Jan, which is as we make people part of the story, it inherently makes these stories more real. So my question is, as we're cultivating a culture where audience is more central to the storytelling, what impact is that going to have on the real world? You know, I, I remember looking at The Matrix and saying to myself, like feeling at the end of that film, that there was so much truth in there about what we were doing. And through the lens of creativity, uh, they expressed this. And what, what did I need to do next? Like I came out of that movie feeling like, what do I need to do? And at, at that point in my life, the Wachowskis could have said anything. And I was like, ready. And there are tons of kids that felt the same way. And, you know, I recently, you know, saw a, a, a film called, that I saw only once before when I was a kid, uh, called Powder. And it, it's, it, great film. it's amazing. It's an amazing film. It's so ahead of its time. It's so ahead of its time. And, you know, I, I'm at a point in my life now where after seeing that film, you know, I have the, the systems in place in my life that I can, um, you know, work on an experience, even a smidgen of the type of power that this character Powder had just because of meditation, et cetera. Um, but there, a lot of people don't have these infrastructures in place, the, the, the scaffolded learning. And I think that we need to look at, at entertainment. There's value for us and it's going to happen. So this is not just like, I think it's, this is also inevitable. As inevitable as crowd participation, uh, it's going to be people working together to make a better world and using entertainment and using creativity as the, the uniting force so I think that there's, you know, Star Wars has actually done some great stuff in this area as a brand. Um, and I think that the, I mean, very much what we're working on with Real World uh, are, as, a, as a fandom startup to bring people together, um, you know, we're, 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 we have our project Justice for Hire, which is about fictionalizing solutions to real world problems and, and making sure that people can uh, not only as a character um, grow, but actually grow themselves and this goes into the science behind alter egos which is you know the process utilized by some of the world's top ceos top athletes uh, top actors these, these are very real it's a lot of data on how changing our uh, an alter ego creating and changing one um essentially helps you as a person <laughs> you know in a massive way so i really think that there's there's a way for us and, and this is very much what we're working on every day to give the audience uh, the, empower them uh, with, with the ability to create their own characters, to play in shared cinematic universes, to have these shared cinematic universes have layers woven into the narrative that actually cause real world effect. Because the world is too messed up right now for us not to take action. And when I say us, I mean all of us, including every person watching this. That's what I do. I use LARPs for education and I'm, I'm doing it now. There's a school in Denmark that's all LARP based. Their entire curriculum is live action role playing. Um, so we're doing, the, the one I'm working on is uh, we got a grant, $1.2 million grant from the National Science Foundation to do a science fiction adventure to teach girls programming and um, Ubisoft uh, uh, ubiquitous computing. And so the idea is that we're creating this world to teach. 
and I designed LARPs for the classroom to teach in this narrative world structure because you are empowered in your narrative to learn things. And it's so amazingly powerful. I've seen it. And so this idea of letting people co-create things is so educational. And as Ahmed said, you know, that as everyone here is saying on this panel, that's exactly what it is. This empowerment of creativity helps people learn. It motivates them to learn it because it means something to them. It's personal to them. Oh, that's this person. I want to be this person in this place that I know it's right there. It's, it's amazingly powerful. And I think we absolutely need to harness it now. Jeff, I'd like to start wrapping up this panel with a final question for you. What's the current state of audience participation in storytelling? And what steps are you taking to disrupt the status quo in the industry right now? The current state of audience participation is actually in flux. Um, we see it most powerfully in social media. Uh, uh, we're all participants in this colossal kind of meta narrative. And, um, and in doing so, we're capable of uh, affecting tremendous uh, progressive change in our society. We've seen it and it's, it's just thrilling at, at points. People who uh, historically have not had a voice now have uh, a, an incredibly powerful and compelling uh, voice. But it's also capable of being hijacked by defectors, by parasites, by, by people whose interests are not in alignment with the interests of, of the many. Uh, uh, who are not, uh, who, or who are benefiting uh, uh, from fomenting chaos and, and conflict. Um, we also see it in the, in the reactionary response of mass media uh, to the audience. Um, uh, I have stood in the boardrooms at Viacom. I have beseeched uh, the, the people at Disney, do not wage war with your customers. 100%. Um, uh, I, I, listen, Put it on a t-shirt, Jeff. Make a t-shirt. <laughs> um, if you ascribe to infinite diversity in infinite combinations, the underlying ethos of Star Trek, if you align with the ethos of the Jedi, you would never have sparked this uh, terrible uh, uh, civil war business that is going on between fans and, and these beautiful aspirational uh, uh, story universes. Um, and, and also you wouldn't then become reactionary, which is happening right now. Uh, well, this didn't work, so let's do the complete opposite uh, of it. We'll fire those people and, and hire these people who are conceding, appeasing this small group who happen to be screaming uh, uh, the loudest. Um, yes. And my, my final point is that, that I'm attempting to disrupt this kind of status quo of, of audience participation in storytelling by working hard for storytellers to have more meaningful relationships with their audience. Um, uh, we've all talked about the fact that there is now dialogue. Sometimes that dialogue is us shouting at each other. Um, the next step is a little bit more complicated and demands a little bit more from us, but dialogue must give way to reconciliation. Reconciliation, that's, that's what has, has to happen next in, our, in, in the storytelling process. What is it that has to be done for us to not do the standard hero's journey of, of knocking down everything in our path in order to get the treasure and save our community? What is the alternative to this in, in terms of of finding third ideas so that polarization could give way to a, a network of, of brains that can manifest story worlds that function, um, uh, uh, repair systems that are badly damaged. Um, uh, if we do not repair the system that we're all in, it is self-terminating. That's right. It is self-terminating. We need to reconcile in order to project ideas that we didn't even know we had um, through the combination of minds in order to repair the system and be able to get ourselves out of the situation uh, that Jan has been uh, hinting at for this whole session. Um, uh, please let's uh, join forces and do that. The social filmmaking revolution is upon us. 
Join the movement! Rawr! <laughs>